if you don't believe in science, you're just not intelligent. On January 18th, I released a video reviewing the film Don't Look Up. I ended that video by saying that I don't fault our institutions for acting out of self-interest and narrow self-preservation. I fault the people who think they should behave differently. I am writing the script for the video you're currently watching before I even record that video in anticipation of a criticism that I will likely get. What would you actually expect us to do if a genuine global emergency was happening? If a comet was hurtling towards the Earth, surely I'd ditch the libertarian crap and embrace some collective solution, right? Well, I'm willing to admit that yes, in a situation like that, that's a genuine Armageddon-level event, I would view things a bit differently. And I'm not the only one. Ayn Rand is not a libertarian, but she describes more or less how I feel about this in her essay, The Ethics of Emergencies. She writes, It is important to differentiate between the rules of conduct in an emergency and the rules of conduct in the normal conditions of human existence. This does not mean a double standard of morality. The standard and the basic principles remain the same, but their application to either case requires precise definitions. An emergency is an unchosen, unexpected event, limited in time, that creates conditions under which human survival is impossible such as a flood, an earthquake, a fire, a shipwreck. In an emergency situation, men's primary goal is to combat the disaster, escape the danger, and restore normal conditions, to reach dry land, to put out the fire, etc. By normal conditions, I mean metaphysically normal, normal in the nature of things and appropriate to human existence. Men can live on land, but not in water or in a raging fire. Since men are not omnipotent, it is metaphysically possible for unforeseeable disasters to strike them, in which case their only task is to return to those conditions under which their lives can continue. By its nature, an emergency situation is temporary. If it were to last, men would perish. So, if ever there were something that met Rand's definition of a metaphysical emergency, it would be a comet hurtling towards the Earth that will kill everything on the planet should it make contact. It's unchosen, unexpected, only there for a limited time, and yes, would make life completely unlivable. Given that it would eradicate all life on the planet, everyone on the planet would have an immediate interest in the comet not making contact. Fortunately, we actually do have plans for something like this. Dr. Amy Mainzer, who is an actual astronomer who consulted the writers of Don't Look Up, did an interesting interview with Wired on what we would do if such a thing happened in real life. Fortunately, NASA already has plans in case of this contingency, and they're relatively simple. You change the trajectory of the space object. If we have, you know, years to decades away from any potential impact, you've got things that are as simple as just bumping into the object. We call that a kinetic impact. You just basically take a spacecraft, you load it into a rocket, and you send it into the path of the comet or the asteroid. And nature takes its course. Boom. Don't get me wrong, I have no doubt that the math and the machinery involved would be extremely complicated. It's just simple in its essence, especially compared to other proposed solutions to different problems, as we'll see. Of course, the premise of the movie is that no one actually takes the situation seriously in a way that it deserves. And I certainly don't fault Don't Look Up for that plot conceit. It's a movie, and a comedy movie at that. That said, the movie is an allegory for climate change, and as the guy who originally came up with the story, David Sirota, said that its central lesson is applicable to other scientific questions. And by the way, it goes beyond just climate change, right? I mean, it, it, when, when this movie was being made, it, it was a climate allegory, but then the pandemic came up and, and there's been all sorts of, of rejection of, of basic science when it comes to that. And on that front, I believe that the movie fails. Of course, as an allegory, there isn't going to be a one-to-one -one comparison. The problem is that the creators of Don't Look Up are analogizing a genuine emergency with things that are not. For starters, they extrapolate problems in ways that I don't believe are warranted. Many people argue that in the case of coronavirus, climate change, or any number of other problems, there are significant externalities associated with individual behavior. Hence, the community needs to take action. The problem cannot be solved individually, there must be regulation. I think most Americans have a live and let live impulse, but when you introduce the interests of an unwilling third party, a lot of people change their outlook. An obvious example is drinking. 
Most people agree that alcohol should be legal, and as sad as alcohol abuse can be, most people don't think the government should get between the alcoholic and his drink. Of course, the moment that intoxicated person gets behind the wheel, they endanger other unwilling people, hence the government has an interest in stopping that person from driving while impaired. This is a pretty clear-cut case of curtailing freedoms to protect third parties. Your right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. At what point exactly third parties become affected by another person's behavior is often the point of contention in these debates. A tactic of the pro-regulation side is to extrapolate the consequences of an individual's behavior as much as possible so it inevitably affects others. For example, just over a decade ago, there were all sorts of efforts to curtail public smoking. And these efforts have largely been successful. Most major American cities have banned indoor smoking at this point. I was living in Milwaukee when the indoor smoking ban was up for a vote. The marketing campaign revolved almost exclusively on the hazards of secondhand smoke. They had these obnoxious radio ads where some bartender or waitress would complain about having to sit through other people's smoke for their entire shift and they were facing negative health repercussions for doing so. Of course, the fact that they worked where they did of their own volition was rarely, if ever, mentioned in these ads. That didn't really seem to matter. The people who favored the indoor smoking ban had their sympathetic, unwilling third parties. And it worked. Rather than the decision being left to any individual establishment, indoor smoking has been strictly prohibited in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for over a decade. Whether genuinely believed or concealing some surreptitious agenda, the argument from externalities is a popular one because it is extremely persuasive. I run into this when I talk about international trade. I can throw around all the numbers and charts that I want about the benefits of comparative advantage. When it comes to persuasion, those will simply never hold a candle to some sob story about some downtrodden town in the Rust Belt. And that's how climate change activists usually like to argue. They have their charts and numbers as well, but they seem to get a lot more mileage out of pointing out the natural disasters that happen across the world that are supposedly associated with climate change. Some of the more honest ones are willing to concede that no individual weather event can be attributed to climate change, but they argue that the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events increases. This is how they justify, during a genuine immediate emergency, like a flood or a fire, shoehorning in their talking points about carbon emissions. Emissions. If they can make something like climate change, which happens over a long period of time, is inevitable, and actually is manageable, and conflate it with something that is unpredictable, sudden, local, and makes survival very much impossible, then they've made climate change into an emergency. So, how do they propose that we deal with this emergency? Well, unlike an emergency as defined by Ayn Rand, climate change is a problem of our choosing. According to most climate activists, we need to drastically reduce our greenhouse emissions starting now. If we don't take drastic action, we'll continue to see the degradation of the Earth, which will fall disproportionately on people in the third world, aka the people who use fossil fuels the least. We know this, we simply refuse to act. David Sirota seems to think that we have these very obvious solutions to problems like climate change and coronavirus, our institutions, particularly the media, just fail to communicate the information to the public effectively. Can we even process them? Or do those facts become weapons in a culture war, a media war, a right. partisan war? And, and that's what's really scary, because we know we have all sorts of crises that we face, and we actually know we can fix a lot of them, or at least address a lot of them. But so often the solutions become the cannon fodder in all of these different culture and media wars, rather than things that we can stipulate and act on in a constructive way. If only the people had the correct information, they would fall in line and embrace the solutions that people like David Sirota favor. And here's where the analogy to a comet hurtling towards the planet really breaks down. Unlike an apocalyptic comet, the solutions to a lot of other problems they're referring to aren't really clear, and they come with significant trade-offs. For example, there are enormous benefits to using greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels, life-changing and life-saving benefits. People like Alex Epstein, the author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, a book that I highly recommend, has argued quite effectively that fossil fuels are a net benefit for humanity, even if we take the drawbacks, which do exist, seriously. As Epstein has pointed out, fossil fuels make way more of the Earth habitable than it otherwise would be. I'm not going to restate his case, but I'll just say that, as I write this video, it's negative 14 degrees outside of my apartment, the sun only shines for 9 hours of the day, assuming it's not overcast, and the wind is incredibly erratic. 
People wouldn't be able to live where I do at this time of year were it not for fossil fuels or nuclear power, which a lot of environmentalists also oppose for some reason. Taking those away would create a genuine emergency for me and a lot of other people. Unlike fossil fuels, there is absolutely no benefit to a comet hitting the Earth and wiping out all of life, unless you're one of those people who thinks that humanity deserves to die. Then it's only an upside, I suppose. I hope most of you don't feel that way. Now, let's consider the coronavirus. As far as I can tell, there are no real benefits to this virus. We would all be much better off if COVID-19 just disappeared tomorrow. Unfortunately, we don't really know how to make that happen. It's not exactly clear how, or even if we can, reduce the spread of COVID-19. I'm no expert, but as far as I know, the jury is still out on whether masks, lockdowns, social distancing have any effect at curtailing the spread of the virus. And all these measures come with enormous costs, especially lockdowns. There's a reason why we, say, usually have education in person. It's because doing it remotely is simply less effective. This is the price we've paid in an attempt to have fewer casualties of the disease. The deaths of coronavirus are surely tragic, and we don't know how many deaths there would have been were it not for doing these things. But we do know that there are fatalities and other consequences on the other side of that ledger as well. Even vaccines and treatments like monoclonal antibodies, both of which I favor, are not magic bullets. And like anything else, they come with their own set of trade-offs. And this is my biggest pet peeve with the follow the science crowd. They seem to think that if we all just agreed on what the problem was, we'd embrace a particular solution. As if their proposed solutions are just logical extensions of acknowledging the facts themselves. As if accepting the solutions are just a matter of science as well. You have to actually care about science because science is actually real. And whether you want to argue that the meteor is coming or not coming is irrelevant because of hashtag facts. Like when a meteor crashes to Earth, the, we all die. Senator Cinema, are you not aware that the clueless politicians of the movie are partly based on you? Holy cow, you don't know that? You just killed funding for climate change in the Build Back Better bill. You are the bad guy. <laughs> you are the meteor. You're pro-meteor, okay? One does not necessarily follow the other. It's one thing to say follow the science, climate change is happening, and another to say follow the science and embrace the Green New Deal. A comet hurtling towards the Earth is a matter of physics, as is the relatively straightforward project of knocking it off its path. Climate change is a question of climate science, which involves far more variables. And the proposed solution, the Green New Deal, or any one of its imitators, are matters of public policy, which concern even more variables. It is a fallacy to make a package deal out of these things. Many of the advocates for the Green New Deal even admit that its scope goes far beyond the environment. The Green New Deal aims to reshape our entire economy and our society. It seeks to address problems that aren't even directly related to climate change. And today, I think, is a really big day for our economy, the labor movement, the social justice movement, indigenous peoples, and people all over the United States of America. Because today is the day that we truly embark on a comprehensive agenda of economic, social, and racial justice in the United States of America. That's what this agenda is all about. Because climate change, climate change and our environmental challenges are the, one of the biggest existential threats to our way of life. As AOC's former chief of staff even acknowledged, it's far more transformational. The interesting thing about the Green New Deal, Shoykat Chakrabarty told the Washington Post, is that it wasn't originally a climate thing at all. Do you guys think of it as a climate change thing? Because we really think of it as a how do you change the entire economy thing. Sam Ricketts, climate director for Washington Governor Jay Inslee, said of the Green New Deal, When it comes to a nationwide economic mobilization, there's more to come on this front, for one. And other key components we're going to be rolling forward speak to some of the key justice elements of this, ensuring every community's got a part of this. Many of these people advocating for the Green New Deal see it as a vehicle for social justice. It's fine to be concerned about climate change. It's even fine to advocate that we move away from fossil fuels. I think you're wrong, but you go right ahead. Just don't pretend that your efforts to reshape the economy are a matter of science. And don't conflate these measures with comparatively simple tasks. 
the Soviet Union set out to implement what they called scientific socialism. Unfortunately, science didn't work in managing the economy. There's a reason why the USSR was able to send a man into space, yet their economic planning couldn't keep the shelves at a grocery store stocked. It's because the former is a question of science, and the latter really isn't. Don't let their talk of emergencies persuade you otherwise. Mm.